But as I'm looking on at the bottom of the engine and, and the truck does its rocking, there's some kind of movement over here in my peripheral vision, my left eye. And I turned my head just in time to see the jack that was underneath the axle uh, had slipped out. 10 to 12,000 pounds of weight, um, you know, of steel dropped, you know, whatever it is, a foot and hit the cement. When it fell through me, blood shot out of my mouth and onto the cement. So I know my body is you know, crushed all the way across the middle. Turns out, we found out later, I was thinner than my spine in the middle because my, my L4, L5 vertebrae were both broken. The pain was absolutely off the charts. So if you will, from the bottom of my ribs to the top of my pelvic, your soft part of your belly, where your belly button is, that whole soft area was pushed down in a big flat spot. Wiley Coyote getting run over by acne truck, you know, and he's got that flat spot in the middle mm -hmm. of one. Right. I am definitely gonna die. So it was actually three major arteries severed completely in five places. Bodies. And then all of a sudden there is this realization that I can't take that next breath. And I'm literally just doing this. <gasps> I literally heard my last heartbeat. My heart just went up, 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 up. Hi, welcome to Touching the Afterlife. Today I have with me Bruce, and Bruce truly has one of the most miraculous stories I have ever heard. So welcome with me, Bruce Veneta. Bruce, hi, welcome. Hello. So in 2006, we owned a mobile diesel repair business, my wife and I, and I traveled around the state doing on-site mobile repair. Um, every, every hospital, for instance, has diesel generators that in case the power goes out, the diesel generators kick on and somebody's got to come repair those diesel generators on site and uh, large uh, construction sites or places, gravel pits, there's all kinds of places where there's diesel engines located in areas that are not easy for them to be brought into a shop to get worked on. So somebody has to go work on those things remotely. That's the business that I did. I did on site remote diesel repair. Um, didn't do any maintenance or anything like that. I just specialized in overhaul and runnability on big diesel engines. So I had a service truck with um, $100,000 worth of tools on this truck, and I would just travel around from place to place. We based the business out of our home. I kept my extra supplies and things out in our garage, and I would just, you know, leave in the morning, go. Some days I would, you know, it could be as close as, you know, 15 minutes or half an hour away. Some days I would drive a couple of hours one way to the location and then uh, drive a couple hours back. So this particular uh, day that I, uh, the accident happened November 16, 2006, and it was about an hour. The location was approximately an hour south of where we lived. And so Tuesday the 14th, started that job, you know, got up in the morning, drove the hour, worked on site, took the truck apart, diagnosed what was wrong with it, took, took it all apart. It was a Peterbilt logging truck that I was working on. A lot of times the facilities that I'd go to work um, would put their own mechanic uh, with me to work as my um, helper or, or, you know, workmate or whatever. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we work on this thing. It just so happens that the guy that I was working with, his name's Leonard, and I'd known Leonard since I was uh, very young. And so, uh, again, we get to the end of the job on Thursday, November 16th. In order to test the repair, so I was called in because this thing was leaking coolant. It had an antifreeze leak. In order to test the repair, we started the engine and tried to, you know, run it, get it up to temperature so that we could uh, verify that it's no longer leaking coolant. Mm -hmm. So Leonard is um, the other guy that I'm working with. I said, go ahead and start it. So he's up in the, he starts it. It's running maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And I'm just minutes from leaving. I'm wiping my last couple tools off, put them away in my back of my truck. And it was at that time that uh, Leonard comes up, he taps me on the shoulder and he said, hey, before you go, would you uh, look at one more thing? I remember before I answered him, I looked up at the clock on the wall and I remember it was 6, 10 p.m. I'd left my house at 6. I got on job site at 7 a.m. roughly. And so I've already got, it's going to, by the time I get home, it's already going to be over a 13 hour day. And I didn't want to say that I would uh, work on anything. So I'm just kind of looking at the clock, doing the math in my head, thinking I don't want to look at anything else. I just want to go home. And he said, hey, he could see what I was doing. He could tell me I'm looking at the clock. And he said, you don't have to uh, you don't have to fix it. He said, I just want you to diagnose, figure out where that's. So this engine was a Caterpillar diesel engine. So it's a big yellow engine. 
and there's a big dirty spot in the front of the engine. And he said he'd wipe it off and within a couple of weeks it would come back. So he knew, you know, it was seeping oil out of somewhere and he just wanted me to diagnose where it was seeping, order the parts, come back at a later time to fix it. Maybe it was something simple. I could tell him to do whatever. So all that was left to do on the truck at the, at this point was the engine mounted air cleaner was left to put, be put back on. And Leonard is going to put that back on the next day. And then the passenger side front wheel was still removed. He had removed it. He's going to put it on the next day. So that's all that's left. Um, other than that, the repair that I had worked on was done. So uh, the dirty spot in the engine that he wanted me to look at was best looked at from the bottom of the chuck in the front of the engine towards the bottom. So there's a, a tool that mechanics use to go underneath vehicles called a creeper. And basically it's just, uh, you know, a, a long board, if you will, with wheels on it that you lay down on, you go underneath underneath the, the vehicle. And the thing with uh, tools and working with tools for a living, as I did, I actually grew up in a diesel repair shop. I started working for my dad at 10 years old for 25 cents an hour. So I sp spent most of my life working on things. And uh, the thing with tools are there's cheap tools and there's expensive tools. Uh, and cheap tools are very, very aggravating to use. Uh, that's why I had $100,000 of tools on my truck, because good tools are very expensive, but they make the jobs go a lot easier. And the thing with creepers is, if it's a cheap creeper, it can be really, really aggravating because they don't go on the floor very well. You try to go left, they'll go right. They The cheap ones have usually got little wheels that they'll stop on every crack in the floor, every pebble of sand, it seems like. All garage floors have cracks in them. They're cut in them, actually. The newer shops actually cut the lines in the floor. Uh, anyway, but sand, gravel, whatever, little rocks, any of the debris that's on the garage floor, if you're on a cheap creeper, you can't navigate across that stuff. It just stops or it goes one way or another. And so Leonard, the, the guy that's working with me, crawls up from underneath the truck on this piece of junk creeper. And I'm going to go underneath the truck to look at this last little thing. I saw that his creeper was a real piece of junk. I didn't even want to get on it because it was, um, you know, again, so cheap. And I looked in the back of my truck, and in the back of my truck is my Snap-on brand creeper, um, you know, very, three, you know, two, three hundred dollar creeper at least. Big wheels on it, but it was all strapped down. I didn't want to get my expensive creeper out just, just for the, even though I wanted to use a good tool, I didn't want to take the time to unstrap it and get out of the back of my truck. So I got on his cheap creeper, and I go underneath the front of the truck. Now, uh, for anybody watching today that's never looked underneath a big semi truck uh class eight they call them big the biggest trucks that you'll see on the road there's a big front bumper in the front of these trucks old school trucks had typically chrome bumpers the newer trucks have you know plastic white or black bumpers there's that little bit of space between the bottom of the bumper and the ground whatever it's driving on and if you were to get on your knees in front of the truck look from the front of the truck to the back of the truck what you'd see is the lowest thing to the ground is the front axle the bottom of the front axle the reason why is if you if you can picture the two front wheels that move when you turn your steering wheel, right? These wheels move in the front axle and in the middle of those wheels, um, the axle attaches and it, and it drops and it goes from the left side of the truck to the right side of the truck. And it's a big steel I beam basically. And it's, you know, maybe a, a dollar bill deep front to back. And it's probably like at least a dollar bill tall. So at least six inches high and, you know, maybe, maybe almost six inches deep. And this big steel I beam that the wheels attach to, is carrying 10 to 12,000 pounds of weight. So five to six tons of weight just on the two front tires. Leonard had jacked up the front axle and with a 20 ton capacity bottle jack on the passenger side um, of the of the truck. So he jacked up that axle. He had removed the passenger side front wheel in order for us to get in, to get access to the engine, to lift off the cylinder head and do our repair. So when I looked underneath the truck before crawling underneath it, I saw that uh, the jack was underneath there holding up the axle. I also saw that there was no safety equipment. Typically, uh, jacks are lifting devices. You would typically lift lift up the truck, lift up the weight of the front of the truck with the jack, and then you would normally put underneath that uh, axle, you'd put uh, some kind of blocking or jack stands to hold up the weight of the jack, to, or rather to hold up the weight of the truck. Unfortunately, when Leonard had jacked it up, he left the weight on the jack and he didn't use any safety equipment. No jack stands or blocking. I saw that. I still went underneath it uh, in my, you know, I saw that it was was not done the, the right way. Um, and I went underneath it anyway. So I go underneath the truck. 
I'm right in the middle of the truck. I'm laying on my back on the creeper. I slip underneath the front bumper. I'm parallel with the basically the center line of the truck. I'm looking up at the bottom of the running engine at the dirty spot that he said is leaking oil. And after doing some diagnosis, I yelled out from under the truck and I said to Leonard, you can go ahead and shut the shut the engine off. I don't need it running anymore. To, to, I, I was pretty sure I knew where it was coming from. So I am look at the bottom of the engine and Leonard gets up inside the truck to shut the engine off. And when he did, the truck shifted as it would normally because it has air suspension. It's normal. Um, but as I'm looking at the bottom of the engine and, and the truck does its rocking, there's some kind of movement over here in my peripheral vision, my left eye. And I turned my head just in time to see the jack that was underneath the axle uh, had slipped out when when he had got in the truck and the whole thing sl- shifted. Mm-hmm. The jack had slipped out. And actually, the movement that I was watching was the jack teetering right on the very, very, very edge of the axle. And before I could do anything, that jack shot out like a rocket. And this 10 to 12,000 ton- 10 to 12,000 pounds of weight, um, you know, of steel dropped you know, whatever is a foot and hit the cement. Uh, when the, when the truck fell off the jack, I was laying underneath the axle. The axle was maybe just an inch or two above me, literally when the truck fell. So this, this five to six tons of steel drops, you know, a foot or whatever it was. When it hit the cement, it sounded like a bomb went off. It was this incredible, uh, just loud explosion noise as the steel hit the cement. And it was a weird, uh, mm. weird thing because not only was this loud explosion noise, but I heard splashing liquid inside it, in my head is the best way I can describe it. Oh, wow. When the truck fell on me, it fell through the middle of my body like a blunt guillotine. And when it hit the cement over here on my left side, because there's no wheel to hold it up on that side, it hit the cement. I could literally just about re- probably reach out and touch where it's touching the ground. Um, blood on impact when it fell through the middle of my body. Like I said, it's like maybe a dollar bill deep. So this five to six tons of weight fell through the middle of my body. And on impact, when it fell through me, blood shot out of my mouth and onto the cement. And I remember calling out and I said, uh, Lord, help me. For whatever reason, I said it a second time. Mm -hmm. Lord, help me. I said the same thing. And I, when I say, Lord, I'm referring to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, so I called it Jesus, help me, Lord, help me twice. I looked down and on the left side of my body where the axle was the closest, you know, where it's literally touching the cement over here, there's maybe an inch of space between the bottom of the axle and the cement. The cheap plastic hollow core creeper that I was on, it had no wheels in the middle or anything. It was just a hollow core creeper. It flattened out. It collapsed to nothing. And there was, like I said, maybe an inch of space between the bottom of the axle and the, and the cement. So I knew that my body was approximately one inch thick on the left side of my body. Go to the other side. The wheel is still on. The axle is going up at an angle because the wheel is still on on that side. And it was at least double. It's so probably two inches of space between the bottom of the axle and the cement. So I know my body is, you know, crushed all the way across the middle. Turns out we found out later I was thinner than my spine in the middle because my, my L4, L5 vertebrae are both broken. Um, according to the radiology report, it says they were spider cracked and D-shaped. So I was thinner than my spine in the middle of my body, uh, a lot thinner on the left, and I guess probably thicker on the right. So everything across the middle, between the basically between the bottom of my ribs and my pelvic bone, everything across there is in the middle of my body is crushed, destroyed. The pain was absolutely off the charts. Um, I can't tell you how bad it hurt. It was incredible pain. So the the axle, if you has fallen through me at this point, I could just see the gap on each side. The pain is off the charts and Leonard didn't shut the engine off. Um, the jack slipped before he could shut the engine off. So he got down out of the truck. The passenger side of the truck is, is fallen. So the passenger side fuel tank is, you know, it's smashed up in and the, the, the big bumper behind my head is touching on the ground on the passenger side on the driver's side back here behind my head. I'm just, you know, I'm just underneath the front of the truck, just past the, the that front bumper. So there's a gap behind my head back here. I can see out from underneath the truck on the driver's side by the, you know, the front bumper. And Leonard got down and he's looking underneath the front bumper. And we're looking, we're catching eye, we're looking at each other. So he's looking at me and I'm looking at him from underneath the bump bump, underneath the front bumper here. And his eyes were, uh, he was in, he wanted to shock. His eyes were great big. And I could see him 
the look on his face was utter shock, utter horror, uh, but also guilt because he had jacked up the truck and mm -hmm. not used the safety equipment. And he just froze, went into shock. And so I'm looking at him and he's looking at me and he's not moving. And it's what seemed like forever. And I started to say, Leonard, please call 911. I was, you know, uh, I couldn't talk very well, obviously. So I'm saying, you know, Leonard, please call 911. He's not moving. He's just looking at me with these great big saucer eyes. And I kept saying it. And there's, again, no movement. He's looking at my body crushed in half, basically. And he wanted the shock. So I don't know how long it's it lasted. It seemed like forever to me. Finally, he shook out of it. I could hear him yelling on the phone. We're in the middle of basically nowhere, very, very remote area of Wisconsin, as you'd expect the logging business to be. Uh, so it's a volunteer fire department in the middle of nowhere. So I can mm -hmm. hear him yelling on the phone. Truck is falling on somebody. He's crushed in half. You know, send people as quick as he can. As soon as he hung up the phone, I started begging him to shut off the phone or to shut off the engine because he never shut it off. And the the big you know, the axles on top of me, it's got my vertebrae pinned down. It's got the, the creeper collapsed and broken in the middle, but the axles just vibrating on top of me because these big diesel engines vibrate. So I'm begging him to shut it off. He got back up in the truck. He shut it off. It made the pain just minutely better. He got down out of the truck. He went and got the jack and now he's trying to figure out how he can, uh, he couldn't put the jack back underneath the axle to get the truck off my body because the axle on the cement. So he's trying to figure out how he's going to jack the truck up off of my body. So there's a big curved leaf spring attached to that axle. It's the suspension for the truck. So if you will, across the middle uh, where that axle attaches to both leaf springs on the left and right, the leaf springs are big, a big arch. If you're looking from the side view of the truck, it's just a big curved leaf spring. And so it, you know, attaches the frame and it comes down, attaches to the axle in the middle and it comes back up and attaches the frame again. So you got this big curved, you know, you've got this big curved leaf spring and he puts the jack underneath the arc of the spring and he starts jacking it up in the front over here. And you don't want to jack something up on an arc. You want to jack something up on a flat surface so that the jack doesn't slip, but mm. it wasn't, it was on the arc of the spring. And so I'm looking at it and I'm saying to him, don't jack it up there. It's just going to, the jack's going to slip. So I'm begging him, don't jack it up there. And he's saying to me, it's the only place I've got. And he just kept jacking and the jack just kept slipping. And finally the jack caught on the edge of a little, bracket a piece of steel on those on those leaf springs and so the truck started going up finally so now he's jacking it one pump at a time and it's going up going up going up and i could see that the jack was precariously barely touching the spring so i know that it's just it could easily just shoot right out so he's going up and up and up so now i can see my body for the first time the, the whole of my body the top and bottom because when the axle had fallen through me i could only see from the from my ribs up basically so now when I see my body, uh, what I saw was this. If I turned sideways to you, I could see my work uniform that, you know, went down. And then when it got to the edge of my ribs, my work uniform uh, went straight back towards my spine. And then the, the flat spot, the, the uniform followed along my spine and then came back up at my pelvic area, my pelvis. So, so basically, if you will, from the bottom of my ribs to the top of my pelvic, your soft part of your belly where your belly button is, that whole soft area was pushed down in a big flat spot. And when I saw it for the first time, my body full length and I could see the flat spot, it was so surreal. Uh, anything, nothing I'd ever seen completely out of normal reality that the only thing my brain could compare it to was cartoons from when I was a child of uh, Wiley Coyote getting run over by acne truck, you know, and he's got that flat spot mm -hmm. in the middle of one the rock lands on him. He's flat like a pancake and he's going down like that, like a feather. That's the only thing I could compare my own body to was literally Looney Tunes cartoons as a child. And the next thought was, there's no way that I should be able to, there's no way anybody should be able to look at their body and right. still live. That right. I'm, I'm definitely going to die. So that's what I'm looking at myself. The, the pain is off the charts. I'm looking at my body crushing in half. I'm thinking I'm going to die. When he jacked the truck up off of my body, immediately weakness. I, I had this incredible pain, but immediately weakness took over my body. We found out later from the doctors that the reason why I experienced weakness was I had five places that the major arteries were completely severed inside my body. So it was actually three major arteries severed completely in five places, if that makes sense. So as soon as he jacked it up off of my body, I began to bleed out. I was bleeding out internally. And the doctor said, that's why 
I was feeling so weak. So I've been told by doctors, uh, multiple doctors, multiple times, they say if you have one major artery severed, you're going to bleed out in like eight to 10 minutes. I had major artery severed in five places. So I am bleeding out now that he's uh, removed the truck from my body. I'm bleeding out. I'm afraid the jack is going to slip because it was precariously there. I'm going into shock uh, because my body's, you know, crushed in half. So I'm yelling out to Leonard or m probably mumbling and saying, please, I want him to get me off with the truck because I'm afraid the jack was going to slip. It was going to fall me again. And it already hurt bad enough. So I'm begging him um, to get to pull me out, to pull the creeper from out underneath the truck. And he was, you know, he saw I've got a, a flat spot across my body. And most people have been told you don't want to move somebody with a back injury. So mm -hmm. Uh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. And so I keep saying, please get me up from the truck. And he's saying, no, I've called 911. They're going to come help you. So I'm panicking. I reach back and I grab the bottom of the, the bumper back here behind my head. I could just grab the bottom of it. And in a, you know, again, I'm in panic mode. Obviously I'm in shock. So I took everything I had, but I was able to drag myself out. I grabbed the bottom of that bumper and I was able to drag myself out. And I looked, you know, so now my you know, the top half of my body is sticking out from underneath the, the bumper, the front of the truck. And I looked underneath the truck and I could see that the axle was going across the top of my legs. So if the jack slips this time, it's going to fall on my legs towards the bottom of my legs. And so I placed my hands right on the, the face of the bumper, the bottom of the bumper. And I thought if I could do one more push, one more good solid push, I could get my body the rest of the way out. So if the jack slips, the axle is just going to fall on the cement and not my legs. And when I tried to do that second push, um, you know, because I pulled myself out that far already, when I tried to do that second push, I couldn't do it. And my body began to shake um, uncontrollably. And that mm -hmm. doesn't do it any justice. For me to say my body was shaking uncontrollably, that it was, it terrified me because I, I for whatever reason, fixated on my right arm. I had a short sleeve work uniform and my arm and my whole, my bicep, my arm, my form, everything, my whole body was just shaking like a blur, like just crazy shaking. And I didn't have the strength to do that last push. And I, at that time in my life, I could have done, you know, 25 pull-ups easily. I had a lot of upper body strength from doing heavy equipment work in my basically my whole life. And I couldn't even do that last little push. And it really scared me. And it was right then I realized that I couldn't breathe when the truck had fallen on me and it pushed up my diaphragm, collapsed the bottom of my lungs. So my lungs were collapsed and I was, um, I didn't know it. I didn't realize it until that exact moment when I was trying to do that second push that I couldn't suck in any air. And I was trying to get air and I couldn't mm -hmm. breathe in. And the, so I've got this incredible pain that is racking my body. And then all of a sudden there is this realization that I can't take that next breath. And I'm literally just doing this, <gasps> trying to suck in and I can't, can't get a next breath. And my heart is racing um, I'm, I'm list, you know, just like anybody, it's everybody's probably experiences where you're super physically active and you can literally hear your pulse pounding in your ear. So because I'm in shock, my heart is racing. My pulse is, you know, severely ele elevated and I'm, I'm laying there. Just my heart is racing away. And it was the craziest experience because it was just like shutting off an engine. I heard my heart stop. So when I, I couldn't take in that, that next breath, I couldn't grab that next breath of air. And at a certain point, as I'm going uh, 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 trying to breathe, my heart stopped and I heard my last, I literally heard my last heartbeat. My heart just went up, 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 just like it shut off a car, an engine. And at the last, it's simultaneously, it's seemingly with the last heartbeat, my spirit left my body and I went out into the roof of the garage at, you know, I don't know, 14, 15, 16 feet, whatever the inside of the garage is. Um, so I go from feeling obviously the worst I've ever felt in my life crushed in half to feeling the best I've ever felt. So I'm up in the ceiling and and I say all the time when I share this testimony that it was like having a, a party in the ceiling. I'm uh, in absolute perfect, perfect peace. Mm -hmm. The Bible talks about this perfect peace, the shalom, shalom. Mm -hmm. um, it, the Bible talks about Jesus says he's going to send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will give us peace that surpasses our mental understanding. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what I experienced. Peace that surpasses mm -hmm. any kind of mental understanding. I can't, I can't even understand or put words on that amazing peace. I'm just up on the ceiling. Best I can tell you is I was having a party all by myself, an amazing peace. So I just stop here. And, and a lot of times I'll say, look, if you're a Christian, 
I believed in Jesus. I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. The Bible says that we don't have to be afraid of death as Christians. And I, I, I have found that that brings a lot of peace to people. I, I, I've realized that there's a lot of people who have told me that they're afraid to die. And I just want to stop here and say, look, if you're afraid, if you're a Christian, you have Jesus in your heart, please hear me out. You do not have to be afraid of dying. In fact, I fully believe that the day we die is going to be the absolute best day of our lives. I mean that it, like mm -hmm. the best, absolute best day of your life is going to be the day that you die. And that is what it's going to feel like. And that's what I felt like. It's the best day of my life. I'm up there in the ceiling and no pain, no sorrow, no suffering, not afraid, nothing at all bad up there in perfect peace, watching down on this accident scene. And as I'm watching from above up in the ceiling, I'm so disconnected from the accident scene that I don't even know the guy in the truck is me. I don't even realize that that's me. So I'm watching from above. I'm looking down. Leonard, the man that I've been working with, again, I've known him since I was, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. And now at the day of the accident, I'm 36. So I've known him for a long time. He's a family friend. I'm, I'm watching from above and I can see that Leonard is on his knees and he's running his fingers through what turns out I find out later to be my hair. And he's crying, he's apologizing, he's over the top of my, my body. And he's saying things like, I should be the one that's dead, not you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm such an old fool. Stuff like that because he'd not use the safety equipment. And I'm telling you, I'm watching from above the ceiling, listening to everything he's saying, and I could care less. I knew that that guy down there was, you know, you know, what dead, hurt, whatever. But I'm just watching from above, and I didn't feel bad about the guy underneath the truck crushed. I didn't feel bad about what Leonard was saying. I'm just watching it. And the next thing I can tell you is that there's an angel on each side of Leonard. So if you can picture the front of this truck, it's a conventional. So that means it's got a hood, a long nose or whatever they call them. So the hood is shut, big bumper. You got your radiator grill. You got headlights out there. And right dead center in the middle of that front of that truck, my body turns out is sticking out from underneath the front bumper. Again, my head and head, shoulders, arms are sticking up from the front bumper. Leonard is on his knees above me, running his fingers through my hair, crying, apologizing. And on each side of Leonard is an angel also on their knees. And Leonard is, I don't know, six foot one, six foot two. The angels are on their knees. They're shoulder to shoulder with him. And their heads stuck up approximately, let's say, approximately two feet taller than Leonard, I'm guesstimating. So that means that the compared to Leonard, the angels had to be approximately eight feet tall. Um, I've studied the Bible out now and looked it up since this has happened, read every account I can of angels in the Bible. Angels mm -hmm. are mentioned 290 sometimes in the Bible, high 290s. Sometimes they look like normal people. It's in the Bible. It describes them. Sometimes they don't look like normal people. These angels would have been, like I said, eight feet tall, white shining robes. It mentions their white shining robes in the Bible a handful of times. That's exactly what I saw, white shining robes. Uh, these angels didn't have wings. Sometimes, like I said, they, they talk about their wings. I didn't see wings. These were just two, if you can imagine, eight feet tall men, very, very muscular in white mm -hmm. shining robes with long hair. And they had a belt on their robe, and that's right where their hair ended was where the belt was. They were the one from the driver's side. He leans over, and he puts his hands in the middle of the flat spot of the guy that's hurt down there. And the one from the passenger side does the same thing. So the matching bookends, they reach over. They have their hands on the flat area of my – turns out to be my body with Leonard in the middle. I can hear Leonard talking. I never got to see the angels faces, but it was obvious that they were men as they're bent over the body. So I'm looking from above and I'm like, Oh, look, those angels are down there to help that guy. It seems to help that guy. You say yeah, help that guy. That guy. <laughs> exactly. And it seemed normal. It didn't even seem like a big deal. I wasn't excited about the angels or anything. It's just like, Oh, those angels are down there to help them. I have contemplated that over and over. And the only reason I can make any sense of that, it would seem normal for me to see the angels is because in the spirit realm, they're normal. And that's why it didn't seem like a big deal to me in the ceiling. So I'm just watching down. I'm, you know, again, the angels never talked or anything. They just, but they had their hands in your abdomen. Yeah. Right in the flat spot, both sides. Wow. One from the driver's side, from the passenger side. And I'm, you know, you could see it right in that flat spot. They had their hands right there. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, they're helping that guy somehow. And I'm watching now it's a volunteer fire department at this point. Eight of the people from the volunteer fire department are around there. They're not going to do CPR. Um, no heartbeat, no pulse. They're not going to do CPR because I have a massive chest injury. So they are literally staying around quietly talking respectfully. Um, they've already called med flight. Uh, mm. There's really at this point, nothing they can do. So Leonard is just crying above me. 
the angels are reaching over, they're touching me, and I'm just watching off from above. And as I'm watching from above, everybody had come in behind me on, through the big, the main entrance of this garage on a blacktop driver that goes out to the road. All eight people from the volunteer fire were coming through those doors, just like I had backed my truck in and out of that blacktop driveway. But number nine and 10 that showed up came in on the back, uh, back corner of the garage. And so it was the only woman, a red haired lady found it later. Her name is Shannon Celia. She came up the driver's side of the truck with a gray haired guy. Um, the only gray haired guy also. So the only gray haired guy and the only woman with, and she happened to have red hair comes up the driver's side of the truck. She gets down between the angels. And I'm just going to stop here and say that, uh, for anybody just contemplating that a year later when i got out of the hospital i went and spoke at that volunteer fire department just to tell them thank you and it was a surprise for the group the only one that knew i was coming on their monthly meeting was the was the chief i was able to um you know tell them thank you and stuff but i was able to go around the room of roughly 30 people for the volunteer fire department and i pointed out eight of the 10 people that had come to the scene of the accident my accident a year before when they got there I'm with no heartbeat, no pulse because I bled out all except for the first two guys. The first two guys got there. I was still there. And um, when I, when my heard my, when I heard my last heartbeat and I left and one of my spirit left in the roof, the garage, there was two, the first two guys had gotten there, but then, you know, six more people come to make it eight. I watched, they all come through the front. And then the last two people, number uh, nine and 10 came in the back door. A year later, I asked, in that group of, you know, the volunteer fire department. And I, I pointed to the red haired lady, Shannon, this other guy. And I said, you and you came in the back door. Why? Everybody else came in the front door. It just, it just a curiosity. It was just, it didn't make sense. It's been a year at this point. They had a hard time even remembering. Then they're like, oh yeah, that's right. We missed the driveway. We drove by, we saw the flashing lights. We came up a, a, the secondary driveway, the gravel drive that comes to the back of the shop. It was just a simple little detail. But the, the point is, Real Bruce, Bruce's carcass underneath the truck, no heartbeat, no pulse. I shouldn't have been able to tell them what door they came in. But mm. because my spirit was in the roof of the garage, I was able to say to Shannon and the other guy, you and you came in the back door. Again, that's a little detail, but that little yeah. detail proved to those 30 people, the real Bruce was in the right. in the ceiling, not laying at the truck. So I watch her come up the driver's side of the truck. She, Leonard moves out of the way because he's been on his hands and knees above me crying. She's feeling for a pulse and it, and at that point, um, she says, what is his name? Leonard says, I listen from above. He says, it's Bruce Veneta. And there's a big guy in bibs on what to my left from above, which would be the passenger side front corner of the truck. He was wearing what I would call farmer bibs, the striped blue and white bibs. I don't know. Big guy. And he had his arms crossed. There was a, a smaller guy next to him, looked small next to him. And he says to this lady, Shannon, who's feeling for a frantically feeling for a pulse. He says, it's too late. And he's already passed and mm. she ignores him. She keeps from feeling for pulse. And, you know, she says, what's, what's his name? Leonard says, Bruce Veneta. And the lady starts slapping me in the face or slapping that guy in the face and saying, Bruce Veneta, come back, come back. So mm. everybody that's the volunteer fire department people all stop talking. I'm watching from above and they all turn and look at her and basically give her the, what are you doing? Crazy lady look. Because she's slapping this guy with no heartbeat, no pulse in the face and saying, come back, come back. So everybody quits talking. They're just looking at her basically in shock. She keeps saying, Bruce, Vanetta, Bruce, Vanetta, come back, come back, slap me in the face. And the only way I can describe it is it seemed familiar. And the name, I wouldn't have said it was my name, but it somehow sounded familiar. And it like it caught my attention. And I started creeping down from where I was in the ceiling, my spirit slowly 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 and then when i got about halfway i went really fast it seemed like my spirit came back into my body and when my spirit came, comes back into my body my heart miraculously starts again no medicine no um, cpr yeah. nothing like that my heart miraculously starts we found out later this woman shannon was 38 years old the day of the accident she was a two-month-old baby christian she had been believing in jesus for two months this woman shows up to see the accident and when she was slapping me in the face she was praying and commanding my spirit to come back into my body. Wow. So my spirit comes back into my body, my heart starts. But when I come back in, I go from feeling the best I've ever felt in my life to feeling yeah. the worst I've ever felt in my life. And the pain 
I, again, there's no words to describe how bad this hurts to be completely crushed in half. The pain was so bad. I, I just am I'm curled up. And I, I remember I said, oh, four letter word that means fertilizer. I've got my eyes closed. It hurts really bad. And I can't stand it. I can't stand the pain. I'm like, no, I don't want this pain. And when I made the mental decision that I don't want this, I don't want to be in here. I want to be back up there. My heart stopped. My spirit left my body. I went up back in the roof of the garage. People have uh, questioned that, have been puzzled about that. The only answer I have that makes any sense to me is God is a God of free will. And when I said, Mm -hmm. I don't want this, it hurts. He honored my free will. My spirit left my body. I went back up the roof of the garage. This time, a tunnel opened up and people that have had near death or out of body experiences, a lot of times will talk about seeing a tunnel with a light on the end of it. That is, the Christians will say that. That is exactly what I experienced. There was a tunnel going out of the roof of the garage at like a 45 degree angle. There was Mm. a bright light on the end of the tunnel. And I know that I know that I know, I knew it, Mm. that heaven wasn't in the tunnel and Jesus was there waiting for me. I got in the tunnel. I started going towards the light. I was happy. I was excited to go to heaven to go meet Jesus. I could feel G-force. I was going really, really, really fast. It seemed like I got maybe about halfway there. And all of a sudden I got, I stopped because I could hear in the behind me, I couldn't see it, but behind me, I could hear this. Bruce went out to come back, come back. I got sucked backwards out of the tunnel. My spirit, I'm back in the roof of the garage. I'm looking down. I see the angels. I see the lady. I could see her, Shannon. I could see her slap me in the face. I look up. I see the tunnel. I see the light. You know, I know it's heaven there. And all of a sudden, my spirit starts coming down, down, down. And it's back, pops back inside my body. When my spirit come back into my body, again, this horrible, horrible pain. And then I looked on my left and I looked on my right for the angels that I've just seen twice from above for a long time, what seemed like a long time. Mm -hmm. I looked on my left and my right and I couldn't see the angels anymore. And it really scared Mm -hmm. me. And I couldn't understand why they had left or where they went. And there's nothing there. I mean, I'm looking on my left and right. There's nothing. All I can see is Shannon's face. She's right above me right here. Um, This horrible, horrible pain is racking my body. And I'm just closing my eyes and just, grimacing, uh, the pain, the fear thing, I'm going to die. I I mean, I was just up in the ceiling, you know, all of it is just so overwhelming. And in that uh, moment of fear and horrible pain, I heard God speak to me, just a still small whisper. And literally all he said was, if you want to have to, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight and it's going to be a hard fight. Mm. He sounded very calm. He wasn't freaking out. He wasn't scared. He was very calm and just said, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight. It's going to be a hard fight. And I was, it didn't, it was like instantly for me to go, no way. I don't want to live. I don't want to fight. This hurts too bad. My spirit mm-hmm. left my body the third and final time. I went up the roof of the garage. The tunnel opened up. I got in the tunnel. I started going towards the light. Now it's been the second time I've been in that tunnel. And as I'm rocking away towards the, towards the light, happy to go to heaven. Again, I can hear uh, this voice somewhere back behind me, I could hear her saying, Bruce, I'm to come back, come back. I mean, now, obviously I know it's me. I'm the guy underneath the truck. I get sucked backwards out of the tunnel again. I'm looking down. I can see the angels that I couldn't see just last mm-hmm. time. I can see her and my spirit comes back into my body. And when it comes back in this time, again, horrible pain, my eyes open up mm-hmm. and her face is right here. And this Shannon, this woman says to me, mister, you're on the verge of life and death. What do you mm-hmm. have to fight for? Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? I immediately knew that God who had spoken to me and said, if I want to live, I'm going to have to fight. And it's going to, if I do, it's going to be a hard fight. I knew that I knew that I knew that same Holy Spirit, that same God is now speaking to me through her. I knew it instantly right there. I didn't have to contemplate this. It was just instantaneously. I knew God was speaking through her and he reminds me and he says, she said, what do you have to fight for? Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? Well, I had four small children at that time. We had twins in the middle. So we had, you know, four children and three little over three years. So um, the thought is I've got four little kids. They need me. My wife needs me. I couldn't fight for myself. It hurt too bad for me, um, but I could fight for them. So she said, stay here. Don't close your eyes. They ended up calling the ambulance. The ambulance came and picked me up, took me to a local little hospital where the the helicopter came and picked me up from, took me Mm -hmm. to our state's largest trauma center. Um, When the helicopter landed, they they rushed me in and they begin to do all their emergency, you know, the, 
the surgeries and all their stuff. Um, the doctor gets the, the head of the trauma department gets called in from home. Two other trauma doctors start the operation. He gets called in from home. He comes out after, you know, hours and he tells my wife, uh, this is, this is what the doctor said to my wife. He said, in all his years of being the head of the trauma department, he had never seen a body so badly traumatized and still make it to the hospital. He said to Lori, um, your husband must have one hell of a will to fight. But he said, I don't expect him to live through the hour. Um, he's, he's hurt too bad. We don't expect him to even live through the hour. Mm. We've connected the arteries back up. There's all kinds of damage. There's so much stuff that's wrecked and destroyed. We didn't do anything with any of that. He said, all we did was hook up the, the arteries. We've put, you know, blood. They ended up putting in three times what my body hold or what my body could hold for blood three times the amount that, and it was just leaking out at first when they first got me there. But either way it was, no, here's a, here's something for the medical people. It was over two hours from the point the truck fell on me till they began, till they put a, till I got to the trauma center and they put in blood. So doctor say, if you have one major artery severed, you're going to bleed out in eight to 10 minutes. I had five places they were severed and it stretched out for over two hours. So that was, Doctors say I'm the only one they could find in the whole entire world. They they okay. base that off of they take my case and they they compare it against some two different studies that were done. And from those two different studies and the studies are on the mortality rate versus number of arteries. And based on that, they doctors may claim that I'm the only one they could find in the entire world that's lived after having major arteries severed in five places. Incredible. So anyway, I'm laying there. They're doing their stuff, and they've got me in an induced coma immediately. The doctor comes out and says I'm not going to live. So my wife brought people from our church along and somebody from the church decided that because the doctor said I wasn't going to live an hour, they said that um, they're going to thank God for every 30 minutes that I was alive. If, if, you know, if I wasn't going to live an hour, then for every 30 minutes, they're going to thank God. So they gathered together in a circle, the people that came to the hospital and every 30 minutes, they thank God for another 30 minutes of life. They did that all night long. In the morning, my wife went and talked to the doctor, said, he's not dead, obviously, he's still alive. Are you going to go back in and do the other operations? They said, no, he's, we don't think he can handle it. We don't think he'll be able to tolerate it. They, but the, all these other operations were needed to be done. They're very, you know, uh, stuff that needed to be done soon. Yeah. About noon or 11, you know, three or four hours later, my wife went into the doctors and said, okay, um, He's still alive. Go in and start doing the operations. I give you the permission. Take the chance. If he doesn't make it, he doesn't make it. But we're praying that he does. So just go ahead and do it. So the doctor began to operate on me. They ended up keeping me open that whole week. They operated on and off that whole entire week. I ended up having five major operations throughout the next year. I, I have spent more than a year in the hospital. They ended up having to do, um, you know, again, multiple operations. Adults have... I'm told 18 to 20 some feet length of small intestine. Your small intestine is right basically below your belly button. That's right where the truck fell through me. Um, all of my small intestines got crushed. The doctors were able to save two pieces that were damaged, but mm. it came to a couple, little over two feet of small intestine, maybe, mm. maybe close to three feet of small intestine between the two pieces. Now everybody's got 18 to 20 some feet. So that means they removed at least, you know, 20 feet of intestine approximately from my body, threw it away, sewed wow. together two pieces to try and come up with something. Um, it wasn't enough to live on. So they fed, they were feeding me intravenously, kept me in induced coma for several weeks. I'm being fed intravenously. I lose 65 pounds. I look like somebody out of concentration camp. I'm literally dying in the hospital. Um, one of the two pieces they tried to save died. Accident happened November 16th. Sometime in March of 07, one of those two pieces died. So they had to cut out one of those two pieces. Of, so that was another big, huge operation. I'm going to stand up right now and let everybody see all my scars. Yes. Just, just so you can see um, everything, all the scars that you see are what the doctors did through those five operations and stuff. So just, it might, it, I think it makes it a little more real for some people. So basically from the bottom of my ribs right here where my ribs end mm -hmm. to the top of my pelvic, through here, you can see that ugly scar um, five times. They went through that hole. I don't have a belly button anymore. And I got, oh my I got goodness. A tubes and G tubes and drainage tubes. And, you know, that's why all those little, those extra little scars that you see are from all the tubes that I had. So anyway, 
a piece of died. They went in there, they removed that piece. I am literally starving to death, dying to death. Doctors are saying, you know, I get in a fight with one of the doctors telling them they had to let me go from the hospital because I was a bad, bad patient. I was going crazy in there. I was I'm type A and I can't hold still. And I was saying, look, you got to give me a colostomy bag or whatever. Just let me get out of here because they mm-hmm. had just a tube, plastic tube coming out into a bucket. And they, I couldn't eat. It was just ice chips. I had to fight for those. And um, so they end up, you know, saying – I'm not going to get out of the hospital. They can't permanently, they can't keep me alive for any longer. Six months to a year, I'm going to starve to death is what the, you know, the doctor tells me this one day. So God ends up waking this guy up at 5 a.m. I don't know, a period of time later, um, mm-hmm. you know, weeks later, God wakes up this guy, might've been months, I guess it's probably months, months later. God wakes up this guy at 5 a.m. across the United States, says, buy a plane ticket, fly to Wisconsin, pray for this guy, I'm going to do a miracle. He blew it off, kind of. He told his pastor and he told his wife, but he didn't do it. The next morning at 5 a.m., God woke him up again. And he told me later, he said, I don't like to get up early. And God woke him up exactly the same time and said, buy a plane ticket, fly to Wisconsin and pray for this guy. I'm going to do something. So he was obedient. This man, his name is Bruce Carlson. He came and prayed for me, bought a plane ticket out of his own pocket, came across the United States, prayed for me in the hospital. And when he did, um, he placed his palm on my forehead and began to pray like Jesus teaches in Mark 11 about speaking the mountain with the faith of mustard seed. So instead of praying to God or begging God, talking to God, there's that kind of praying. Mm-hmm. He started doing the Mark 11 type of praying where Jesus said, speak to the mountain. At that point, you're not talking to God. Mm-hmm. You're talking to the problem in the name of Jesus. So he put his palm on my forehead and he said, small intestine, which is the problem. And my pancreas, right? He says, small intestine, um, be healed, come back supernaturally in length, pancreas be healed in Jesus' name. And when he did, it felt like I touched an electric fence on my forehead. I literally felt an electric shock. It went into my body and I felt my intestines coming back. I turned to somebody else that had brought him, one of my friends from church, Brian. I turned to Brian. I said, man, it just, it feels like a snake or a hose is coming uncoiled inside my stomach. I could literally feel something cylindrical rolling around in my belly. Doctors were able to confirm later. um, I have approximately, they say now, one half my intestines. They can't say exactly to the inch because uh, because your intestines are in a big ball of worms for back. You know they're all balled up right underneath your belly button. So you'd have to undo them and stretch them out to measure them specifically. But they can guesstimate, estimate, and they can guesstimate, estimate before and after CAT scans, X-rays. You know all of it. They can see I, I had this little bitty piece. They, that's all that was left. They know from the pathology reports, how much got sent in. I had all this mm-hmm. intestine sent in. I have this little bitty piece left that the doctors measured multiple times and said, Oh, it's, you know, it's hundred centimeters. It's less than hundred centimeters now after they removed pieces. And then all of a sudden now I've got nine to 11 feet. So I've got wow. a, a massive creative miracle. It's the only reason why I'm alive now. It'll be well, 16 years this November, I guess. Um, it's the only reason why I'm still alive. So, so bottom line, my testimony comes down to this. When I called out and said, Lord, help me, he sends two angels that at first I couldn't even see. He sends a lady to pray me back to life. And then he sends um, this guy to pray for me in the hospital. I mean, uh, besides a whole bunch of other people are praying. But he come pray, has this guy come pray for me in the hospital when a creative miracle happens. And we end up starting Sweet Bread Ministries. I've been traveling ever since, as soon as I got out of the hospital. And, you know, I had to learn to literally had to learn to read again and write again in the hospital, had to learn to walk again, had all kinds of rehab. It wasn't right. fun. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't easy. Um, there were <laughs> countless days I was begging God to let me die, literally, mm-hmm. after being saved. Yeah. Countless days. I begged God to just let me die. I was in so much pain and I didn't want to do it. But um, he didn't answer. You know, those Bruce, so, that stands out to me as well. Those Those obedient acts of faith. The Shannon with, you know, speaking through her words, yep. life back into you because she felt the Holy Spirit speaking and moving in her. And then your friend, Bruce, obedient. Who wasn't my friend at that oh. time. He's a friend now, but he wasn't okay. even a friend at that time. He was, right. wasn't even a friend, just like her. You know, somebody that was. True. Yeah. And his obedience, that's, that's even more amazing. And then, like you said, yeah. the angels, it, it's multiple miracles, multiple, multiple miracles, which really. Absolutely. And I say this, I got, I've got to take time to say this. Um, yes, please. You know, 
I didn't spend any time on my background. I didn't tell you anything about who I am. Sometimes people hear this testimony and they get this confused idea. Um, they assume that maybe I was some super spiritual guy or, you know, I've been a good guy and that's why God, you know, a favorite of God or something. And so he's listened and that's why he sent the angels or something crazy like that. Nothing could be further from the truth. I was in rebellion to God and man my whole life, uh, daily pot smoker, sold drugs for many years, multiple, multiple uh, illegal activities, illegal things, mad at God my whole life, um, basically over childhood abuse and neglect and things. Um, God has a sense of humor is all I can say, because he'd pick the biggest skeptic in the room, which is me to have mm -hmm. something like this happen. When people doubt my story, I get it. You know, the atheists or people, even Christians are like, oh, it's, I believe in God, but I can't believe that he'd bring somebody back to life. They can't believe the other eight people in the Bible are brought back to life. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm a skeptic. I get it. Or people see me and say, oh, you're making this up or exaggerating. Look, I get it because I don't believe anybody. I'm, I'm the biggest skeptic. I, we travel and I pray for people. We've been doing it for several years. Uh, like I said, since, since this happened, I've seen God do biblical type miracles that blow my mind. Mm. And I'm the biggest doubter in the room. I will begin to ask these people questions. Mm -hmm. um, an example, a young woman gets out of a wheelchair in a, in a Southern state. And I immediately want to know, I said, Oh, can you tell me what your, what your, what's the spelling of your name? Are you on Facebook? Can I, can I, you know, can we be friends on Facebook or something? And the whole reason I didn't tell her, the whole reason is so I could look up her Facebook account and see if really all of her pictures are in a wheelchair or is she just getting out of the wheelchair for attention. I mean, I hate to say that, but that's the kind of skeptic I am. And I mean, I, so when people doubt stuff, great, I get it. I get it. Um, mm. I, I can't say that I'm a perfect guy. I'm in ministry. I still sin. I'm still got issues. I still struggle with God with about things from childhood. You know, I there's lots of questions I have. I've got, I've got questions, man, lots of them that aren't answered that I don't think are ever going to answer until I get that. But mm -hmm. this is what I do know. I know that when this sinner called out and said, God, help me, he sent two angels. I know that when this sinner called out and said, God, help me, he sends a lady to pray me back to life. I know that when, you know, all these people praying, he sends this guy from New York to pray and this Bruce Carlson and this miracle happens. I'm the last guy in the world that could ever deserve it. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody asked me a question on one of the first times I was on national television and the guy said, if you're the only one that's lived after having five arteries severed, why do you think God saved you? I didn't have an answer, but the Holy Spirit had me immediately turn to scripture. First Corinthians chapter one, starting at 26. And, and he, God said, here's the answer. Here's why I saved you. I choose the lowly things, the despised things. The things that I was not, thinking that. Mm -hmm. That whole list of things so that no one may boast before me. See, I can't tell my testimony and say, oh, it's because I, you know, I read through the Bible every year. I do now, but. That's not why God saved me. It's I couldn't say, oh, it's because, you know, I've got the Bible memorized or I'm a good guy or I made right choice of decisions or I was a great husband or a good father. No, all those would be lies. I wasn't. The only reason why God saved me is his mercy, his grace, nothing to do with me. Um, and I'm just going to continue to share this testimony and try to be faithful to God as best I can for the rest mm -hmm. of my life and tell people, look, there's a God who loves us despite us. Right. And, and he's Maybe. alive and well, even when we pray for things and we don't get the answer, because that's the other heartache and grief that many people I have have, including me at times. It's like, God, I've seen you move so amazingly do these things. But then the next time you pray and pray and pray and seemingly you don't answer the way we want, or it seems like you don't answer at all. And, you know, that stuff is confusing, but God says we're supposed to trust him as, and faith yeah. is, is seeing and his what ways are higher than ours. Right. And that's hard. That's where the rubber meets the road. And that's hard. And I'm just going to be honest, say, Here's a guy that was literally prayed back to life right. from the dead three times, just like the eight people in the Bible. And I still struggle with doubts. I still mm -hmm. struggle with faith issues. I still struggle with sin issues, whatever. I'm just telling you, God is the one who's amazing. He is. Yeah. He's the miracle worker. And it's amazing that he even loves us. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he's in the business of doing that today. And he wants yeah. to, you know, show that miracle power. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us, because this stood out to me, um, I think, was it the night before the accident, what your wife had said to you? So it was actually two nights before the accident. It was Tuesday, Tuesday November 14th. I got home from work that day. I'd started the job that day. And when I got home that night, um, my wife had saved me a plate of supper. It was like a you know 13 or 14 hour day, super long day. Kids are already in bed. I remember that. 
she heated up the plate of supper in the microwave and we ended up getting into a big argument and she started saying, uh, we need to sell the business. We need to go into full-time ministry. Uh, don't go back. She begged me, don't go back to work tomorrow. Um, we got in this big fight about it. We'd never had that conversation ever before that. I ended up slamming my fist on the table and telling her to shut up and leave me alone. I didn't want to hear about it. Um, she worked at the church. I teased her. I called her church lady from Saturday Night Live, if anybody remembers that. It's actually not really a compliment. Um, and, you know, like I said, I, you know, I, I wasn't interested in going into full-time ministry. I enjoyed my job. We made a lot of money. I enjoyed working outside. I enjoyed being the hero and fixing stuff that people couldn't fix. Um, that's pretty much what I did. And so, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to hear about it. And she, the last thing she said to me that light was she repeated this three times after I slammed my fist on the table, tried to pull a par, power play and make it stop. She stood up after I told her to leave me alone. And she said three times, Bruce Venetta, what is it going to take before you're obedient to God? I found out two days later when the truck fell on me, what it was going to take. Um, a year later, after I spoke at the first church, I said how God has got this great testimony now because he sent the angels and, um, you know, had somebody pray me back to life and all this. And so now he's got this great testimony and, and that I kind of basically, I inferred that it was, it was God's plan, God's idea for the accident to happen so they could have this testimony. And literally the very next day, God rebuked me sitting at my kitchen table, the Holy Spirit did and said, don't ever, ever misrepresent me like that again. I did not want the accident to happen. I tried to prevent it. I sent your wife. She begged you under the unction of the Holy Spirit to not go back to work the next day. Mm -hmm. And you slammed your fist on the table and said, shut up, leave me alone. And God said, you weren't talking to her. You were talking to me. I, mm -hmm. I, sent her. I, I, I was begging you through her, but you screamed, shut up, leave me alone. And he said, I was trying to prevent it. So don't ever say that I caused it. It's just my mercy that I sent the angels and, and listened because I tried to prevent it. And I, he's, God knew what the devil had planned. And so he used my wife to try to prevent it, to beg me not to go, to not not finish that job, not go back. Some people say, oh, it's a, you know, like a female intuition or whatever you want to call it. She didn't know something bad was going to happen to me, but she did get really freaky weird. And she did, you know, literally start crying and beg me not to go back to work tomorrow, even though she didn't have a sense that something bad was going to happen. She it was about her. It was about obedience versus disobedience. And um, so. I sometimes will stand up and show my scars and say, these are the scars of disobedience. If I would have been obedient to God, if I would have taken, cause he had called me, I was called ministry. I ran away. I didn't want to go into ministry. If I would have been obedient, I wouldn't have had to have these scars and, you know, lose everything we worked so hard for because I, I had workman's, I did not have workman's comp. I, I was bullet. I thought I was bulletproof and uh, I didn't think I was ever getting an accident. So that mm -hmm. year in the hospital and, you know, we had four hundred thousand dollars of our eighty twenty insurance. Our twenty percent was like four hundred thousand or something crazy. So, so anyway, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, that's the rest of the story. God tried to prevent it, but in my disobedience, I didn't listen. So, Bruce, you have experienced multiple miracles from the hand of God, which changed your life here on Earth. Can you, lastly, just share how that now burns in your heart before you go back to heaven for good? Well, like I said, I, for me, I guess the biggest thing is just letting people know that God is alive and well, and he is in the miracle business, but even bigger than the miracles, even, even bigger than the miracles is that the realization that he loves us. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to tell me I'm a sinner. Nobody has to tell me my junk. Nobody has to tell me my issues, man. I know him. Uh, I can go right through the list. I know my, I know my struggles. I know my issues. And, uh, just, you know, emotional, mental, all of it. And for God to respond to me, for God to send the angels when I say, Lord, help me. I wasn't supposed to be there. I literally was in disobedience. God used my wife to beg me not to go. So for God to um, still send the angels, for God mm -hmm. to send the lady to bring me back to life, um, do all the miracles, do all the healings, all the stuff he's done for me in the hospital. And then subsequently, when I share this testimony, Again, for me, it just proves his mercy and grace. I'm going to die again, just like the eight people in the Bible that were raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. Seeing somebody raised from the dead used to seem to my mind like this crazy, huge miracle. And it is a big miracle, but it's not going to last. It, 
just like they before in the Bible, they're going to die. They died again and I'm going to die again. So it doesn't even last. So the biggest miracle is if somebody received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So when they die, they don't spend eternity in hell. They get right. to spend eternity in heaven. The whole thing about heaven, the Bible says it's a perfect place. And if it's a perfect place, then no sin can be there because sin isn't right. perfect. Sin is bad. And God says it's a perfect place. So nobody that's carrying any sin can go there. But the problem is we've all sinned. So that means nobody gets to go to heaven unless God does something about the sin issue. So he comes up with the idea, I'm going to send Jesus, live a perfect life, pay the price, die, be a sacrifice for everybody's sins. And then if you accept his sacrifice, accept what he did mm -hmm. for us, receive that. He washes away our sin because of his righteousness. And then we can spend eternity in heaven. That's the only reason why this guy was headed to heaven is because of the righteousness of Jesus. Because it sure isn't because of the righteousness of me. Mm -hmm. I've talked to other people who have made it to the end of the tunnel that have had automatic mm -hmm. experiences, died, you know, heart attack, drug overdose, whatever, you know, stroke, drowning. They make it to the end of the tunnel and God or an angel sends them back. It says it's not your time. But even more impactful for me, I've talked to a handful of people who have died and gone to hell. And mm -hmm. these were atheists who did not have Jesus, did not want God. But then they get resuscitated. They come back. They're not atheists anymore. Mm -hmm. And they're telling people just like I am, look, Jesus is real. So for me, that's what it's about. Just sharing with people that God's alive and well. He loves us despite us, despite our issues. Um, and you know what? Maybe if you're a Christian and you're struggling, why am I still struggle with a sin or why do I still struggle with doubts or I str struggle with this or that? Hey, you join the club. I don't mm -hmm. know what to tell you other than the fact that we're stuck in this flesh body. Yeah. But as soon as we leave this flesh body, look out, it's going to be amazing. And uh, it's going to be you get to go life. back to where you wanted to stay. Exactly. <laughs> Are you looking forward to that? I am. My yeah. wife hates it when I say that. My kids hate it when they say that. <laughs> My adult children hate it when I say that, but yeah. I am. I. Uh, it's going to be the best day that any of us have. And so now a new a ministry was birthed shortly after that, Sweet Bread Ministries. Is that where people can find what you're doing Sweet now? Sweetbreadministries.com, mm -hmm. Sweet Bread Ministries. Yep. Great. Our website. Great. Well, it's been such an honor and pleasure to have you share your story here today. And would you, you, Bruce, uh, as you feel led, can you just pray us out for sure. everybody listening? Well, yes. For, yes. Lord, thank you. thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for your undeserved love. We thank you, God, that you offer forgiveness to all of us. Lord, I pray that anybody watching this, that they don't have a relationship with you. If they're not right with you, God, we know it if we're not right with you. If there's anybody watching at any time if now or in the future that knows in their heart they're not right with you, God, you said that you want all men and women to be saved. In other words, to spend eternity with you in heaven. You say that you send your Holy Spirit to draw people under yourself. So I pray that even now and in the future, you continue to use this testimony. Use this video to draw people on yourself. And if you're listening, if you're watching right now and you're feeling a tug on your heart, if you've never received Jesus, your Lord and Savior, all you have to do is, you know what, from your heart, you, I'll give you some words to say, but you own these words. You, you say them, speak them from your heart. Just say this, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I have sinned against you and other people. This day I ask for and receive your forgiveness. I repent of my sins. I ask to make you my Lord and Savior. I, I invite you into my heart. I pray that from this day forward, Jesus, we would have intimacy relationship. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, turn me to the person of God you want me to be. Yes. And all God's children said, amen. We just thank you, Lord. Lord, for the people that are watching, listening, that have struggles, physical struggles, mental struggles, emotional issues. Lord, we just lift them up to you right now. We just speak healing. You said the power of life and death is in the tongue. So I just speak healing over these people as they come to you, Lord, as they reach out to you, the, the, the best doctor ever, the great physician, and treat them to your care. We thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross. You paid the price not only for our sins, but for our sicknesses and our diseases, all of our junk, our garbage, you paid the price for us. So Lord, we just you said we can approach your throne of grace with boldness, with confidence. Mm. It's definitely not because of us. It's because of you. Any confidence we have is in you, Jesus, and the finished work of the cross. So we just lift up everybody listening now or in the future, yeah. watching. We just pray that you'd meet them at their point of need, God, all to your honor and your glory. You're the great physician. You're the mm. great healer, yeah. the best doctor ever. So we just love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. In your name. Amen. Amen.